May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, Lent has begun, starting with Ash Wednesday this past week and continuing on for 40 days, minus Sabbath days, which you know are always feast days, until Easter. Our gospel today speaks of Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness, and we feel invited along with him. Now, over these coming Lenten Sundays, we will notice Jesus sounds different, or rather the gospel readings do. There are no healing scenes, no miracles, no calling of disciples, and we will not hear of him drinking or eating a meal until the Passion reading on Palm Sunday, when first he is betrayed at that table and then offers bread and wine to the disciples as his body and blood. So what do we hear in these Sundays, knowing now what we don't? We hear tension, confrontation, and we hear Jesus teaching his most powerful truths and also the most difficult ones. And here I so appreciate Mark's brevity. Rarely does anyone tell me that they really love confrontation or can't wait to enter into the tension of disagreement. More often I hear how badly it can go or has gone. Jesus shows the way by speaking unvarnished truth. And we are introduced to his authority to do so at his baptism, when the heavens are forever torn apart and the spirit of God descends into him. I know your bulletin says on him. Father Richard and I fixed that for you. It is into him. If you go back to the Greek, and I think that's important because it isn't resting on, it is filling and in him. Why is this a big deal? Because for the Jewish people, prophecy had ended and would not be restored until the end times. This is not Jesus claiming or trying to convince anyone that God is again speaking. This is both, both the voice from heaven and a vision of the Spirit telling them. And then Jesus is driven by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, why not test him right where he is, in front of everyone? What is it about the wilderness? And what might be our wilderness? Where are we tested? Mark gives the most abbreviated version of this story here, and he skips those three tests by the devil, temptations, And he skips any mention of how well Jesus does in the face of this testing. We don't know how that came out in Mark's version. Forty wilderness days with beasts and angels and testing would certainly have changed him. We engage this time as essential and formative. Jesus' story becomes our story at some level every Lent. Important enough that a version of Jesus' testing in the wilderness is told every single year on the first Sunday of Lent. Clearly, our scripture and liturgical forebears wanted us to pay attention to this. This confrontation between Jesus and Satan placed at the start of Mark's gospel is not only about them, it's about the spirit who drove Jesus out there. Is Jesus being portrayed as unwilling to go, I wonder? The Spirit has come into him, filled him, signified his mission, and then drives him into the wilderness to battle Satan. The same word for drove out, drove him out to the wilderness, is soon used later when Jesus drives a demon from someone possessed. When casting out unclean spirits. So is he being strengthened for this work? 
wilderness isn't necessarily a bad place. Although the wild beasts make me a little wary, John comes from the wilderness, and it's where Jesus repeatedly goes to pray. Again, I wonder, what is it about wilderness we are to learn? Is it not only a place for testing confrontation, perhaps also a generative place of strength and discovery of the spirit within us? It is certainly where we glimpse what God is speaking to do, seeking to do through this spirit inhabited Jesus. Through Lent, we will see Jesus in situations of conflict, confrontation, and we'll do it through first Mark and then John, Luke, and back to Mark. And more than any of the others, Mark shows Jesus's ministry as confronting evil anything contrary to God's working with humankind for the good. Jesus' first act in Mark, beyond his speaking and calling the disciples, is to cast out an unclean spirit from a man in the synagogue, a spirit which screams at Jesus and fights for control of the man. It's not a lovely liturgical moment there. It is not a polite extrication. This is loud, confrontational restoration of a man possessed. And we see Jesus unafraid of the danger, even as tensions are heightened. We are getting a foretaste of the strong spiritual concerns of this gospel. And instead of dealing with political authorities or people who don't understand, we see Jesus concerned with what oppresses our spirits, chains our bodies, impedes our minds and gifts. The wild beasts of the wilderness, we too are in a spiritual struggle as we navigate our wilderness, hoping to see the angels more than the beasts. Before that, we listened in on the story of a conversation between Noah and God in our Genesis reading. God will set God's bow in the clouds as a sign of his promise not to flood the earth again. Remember here, a bow is a weapon. It doesn't say rainbow. And God is laying down that weapon, even setting it down, pointing away from humankind if there were an arrow in that bow. It's an enormous symbol, sign of their covenant, reassuringly seen whenever it rains. God says, when a bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. Well, Noah knew wilderness after 40 days at sea, wild beasts too. And we hear God's sign is for both Noah and God. Noah need not fear another such flood, knowing God too will see the bow and remember their frightening 40 days of seasick uncertainty, feeling tested by an ark full of animals. And God will be faithful to the covenant between them. So I come back to wilderness. Is it on the open sea with no end in sight? It may be where we're unwillingly driven, or it can be where, like Jesus, we seek solitude, prayerfulness. Is it daunting, scary, or inviting and calming? We know it as not as a physical space so much as a spiritual one. On the cover of your bulletin, there's a photograph that most of you have seen each year at the entrance to our worship space during Lent. It is a semi-steep cobblestone road, and it might show the wilderness of Lent to you as it does to me. Is it wet from 40 days of rain or from a brief cleansing shower that makes the quiet dawn smell and feel sacred? Are you plodding up the hill because you have to? 
Or are you starting at the top, enjoying the last colors of a sunset maybe, as you slowly amble down? God is with us in our Lenten wilderness. It is not good or bad, it is, as Jesus' baptism revealed, the Spirit of God with us as we go. And we go, joining into Jesus' proclamation of God's kingdom. Looking back to the baptism, Jesus embodies the inbreaking of God's kingdom, of God's reign. Like wilderness, it's no physical or geographic place. Rather, it's the beginning of a new time, a new way. The tearing open of the heavens at Jesus' baptism tears open the veil between God and humankind, revealing God's intention for all creation. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, Jesus says, and it continues to be such a time. Mark conveys that urgency and reaches beyond the immediate scene he punctuates here. Something has happened. The reverberations have begun and we still feel them. The people of God aren't being gathered together in a group and sent to some distant place of safety or milk and honey. Those who hear and heed Jesus' message are to see new possibilities, new realities. Not elsewhere, but in this newly accessible, torn open relationship with God through God's Son. Well, Jesus' words and actions will show this about more than our individual spiritual lives. It calls on us to rethink how all of society's life is caught, carried out. And no facet of life is exempt from working to live into God's reign. We may call this good news, but not everyone will. It threatens some authorities, some structures, privileges. It casts light on our choices individually and collectively. One theologian, William Placker, wrote, what Jesus is beginning is the transformation of the world. That is why those in charge of this world, as it was, ended up killing him. We who follow the living Christ must carry on that transformation and carry it within. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, we give thanks for your coming into each of us and into this faith family. Be ever lively and strong within us in the wilderness, in times of tension, in hard work, in confronting evil and casting it out, and in our solitude and prayers. May we know God's reign as we walk with Christ and in times of trial receive the ministrations of angels. Amen. <laughs>